It's true. God chose me. Stay tuned to see why God chose me and why he showed me mercy. But first, I want to share with you just a teeny bit of my background. I did not go to church growing up. When I did go to church with friends, which was about once every five years, I always felt very uncomfortable and I felt judged whenever I walked into a church building. It just wasn't my scene. My scene was the local bowling alley. I grew up on professional wrestling, Kiss, and Playboy magazine. In high school, I called myself an atheist. Earl Campbell was my idol. Miller Genuine Draft was a very close friend of mine. But none of that had anything to do with God choosing me or not choosing me. God did not reveal himself to me until I was 22 years old. But he chose me before that. Way before that. Absolutely no one can know God unless God reveals himself to an individual. The scriptures teach that God does not reveal himself to everyone at the same time. He chooses to reveal himself to some in this life and the rest he will reveal himself to later. Those he gives the gift of belief to in this life are called the chosen, also known as the elect. God, as the active cause of all things within his entire creation, has chosen his son to be first and foremost. He chose Israel out of all the nations on the earth, and he has chosen some to believe in Jesus in this life. God chose the elect without any input from the elect. God is the chooser, the elect are the choosees. Think about it. What could anyone possibly bring to the table to help God in his decision making? He knows everything and he is wise, knowing best how to apply all of his knowledge. In the granting of belief, God alone is the one who transforms an unbeliever into a believer. God is the only active party in this transformation. The unbeliever is completely passive. Philippians 1.29 from the Concordant Literal New Testament. For to you it is graciously granted for Christ's sake not only to be believing on him, but to be suffering for his sake also. Belief is graciously granted by God. Those granted belief will not die in their sins. Most of humanity will die in unbelief. Notice that God also grants suffering to the chosen. The chosen will believe and suffer for the sake of Christ. Those chosen by God will believe in this life. They have no choice. I had no choice. God can transform an unbeliever into a believer in an instant, in the twinkle of a beer glass. Acts 13, 48. Now on hearing this, the nations rejoiced and glorified the word of the Lord, and they believe whoever were set for life Eonian. Those who are set for Eonian life are going to get Eonian life, which is life in the oncoming eons. God chooses the time and the place when every chosen person will believe, and he also determines the time and the place when the rest will believe. Many in Orthodox Christianity teach that the elect are the only ones who will be granted belief by God and be saved from sin and death. The rest, they say, will suffer torment in hell forever or be dead forever through annihilation. But as we just saw, Jesus was chosen. Does that exclude everyone else from salvation? Israel was chosen. Does that exclude all the other nations from God's goodness? The truth is God grants belief to the elect so that he can work through his elect to reach those who have not yet believed. He works through the elect now in this life and he will continue to work through the elect in the future after this life. As God works through the elect in this life and in the next life, all will be saved and come into a realization of the truth. 1 Timothy 2.4 Our Savior God wills that all mankind be saved and come into a realization of the truth. This is God's will. It will be done. All will be saved and come into a realization of the truth. God will use the chosen to play a big part in bringing the truth to all. Why did God grant me belief and show me mercy in this life? For the answer to that, let's look at God's pattern for salvation. The nasty boy Pharisee, Saul of Tarsus, whom God transformed into the Apostle Paul. 1 Timothy 1.16, the Apostle Paul writes, but therefore was I shown mercy, that in me, the foremost, Jesus Christ should be displaying all his patience for a pattern of those who are about to be believing on him for life Eonian. Paul tells us that he is Christ's pattern for unbelievers who are granted belief and shown mercy. The definition of mercy is a moderation of the severity of justice, 
Now, let's see Paul's fuller description of himself as the pattern. 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 16. The Apostle Paul, I who formerly was a calumniator and a persecutor and an outrager, but I was shown mercy, seeing that I do it being ignorant in unbelief. Yet the grace of our Lord overwhelms with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Faithful is the saying and worthy of all welcome that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, foremost of whom am I. But therefore was I shown mercy, that in me, the foremost, Jesus Christ, should be displaying all of his patience for a pattern of those who are about to be believing on him for life eonian. Paul is a pattern for sinners who are shown mercy and transformed into believers. Obviously, there are various degrees of sinners. As Paul tells us, he is the foremost sinner. Some call him the chief of sinners. So what characterized Saul, the nasty boy Pharisee, is also true of all of us to some degree. Paul says, I who formerly was a calumniator. What the hell is a calumniator? Great question, Ruby. The word calumniator is from the Greek blasphemon. Paul was a blasphemer. He spoke harmful, evil, false words against God, Christ, and his followers. I, too, was a blasphemer. I spoke harmful, evil, false words against God, Christ, and his followers. Paul was also a persecutor of Christ and his followers. I, too, was a persecutor. Paul was an outrager. He violently mistreated Christ's followers. I, too, was an outrager. Not on Paul's level, but an outrager nonetheless. But notice what Paul said God did to him when he was Saul, the nasty boy. But I was shown mercy, seeing that I do it, being ignorant in unbelief. Paul's actions were worthy of death. Instead, God showed him mercy, a moderation of the severity of justice. I, too, was ignorant. I didn't know anything about God, and I was an unbeliever when God showed me mercy. In the showing of mercy, God did this to Saul. Yet the grace of our Lord overwhelms with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Notice what God's grace did to the worst sinner. It didn't just barely cover Saul's mountain of sin. It overwhelmed it. We see this truth reinforced in Romans 5.20. Yet where sin increases, grace super exceeds. Wherever sin is, even if it increases, grace super exceeds. Not just barely, but super exceeds and overwhelms, even for the worst of sinners. Sin is no match for grace. Christ overwhelmed me with grace, with faith, with love. I didn't have any faith in me. God had to give it to me. Verse 15 tells us why Jesus came to this nasty world. Faithful is the saying, and worthy of all welcome, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, foremost of whom am I. Verse 15 does not tell us that Jesus came to save good people. He came to save sinners, even the very worst of sinners. He didn't come to merely offer salvation. He came to save. This truth is reinforced in John 3:17. For God does not dispatch his Son into the world that he should be judging the world, but that the world may be saved through him. God sent his chosen Son to save the world. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And this truth is also reinforced in Luke 19.10. For the Son of Mankind came to seek and to save the lost. That's all of us. We're all lost at some point in our lives. Jesus came to save sinners, to save the world, to save the lost. If he didn't do this, he's a failure. I don't care how you try to spin this. If Jesus didn't save the sinners, if Jesus didn't save the world, if Jesus didn't save the lost, he is a failure. My Jesus is no failure. What about your Jesus? Saul, the foremost sinner, was shown mercy. He was saved. I, too, was a sinner when Christ showed me mercy. Verse 16 again. But therefore was I shown mercy, that in me, the foremost, Jesus Christ should be displaying all his patience for a pattern of those who are about to be believing on him for life eonian. Jesus' patience is vast enough to allow mercy to be shown even to the chief of sinners. As part of the pattern, Jesus displayed his patience to me also. In the pattern of Paul, Jesus proved he has more than enough grace, mercy, and patience for the chief sinner. So obviously he has enough grace, mercy, and patience for lesser sinners, which is everyone. 
This is like Jesus proving his strength to all by lifting the biggest rock in the pile. The smaller rocks and the lesser sinners are no match for Jesus' overwhelming strength, mercy, grace, faith, love, and patience. My God, give him a praise. But there are even more characteristics of the chosen that fit me quite well. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29, the Apostle Paul writes, For you are observing your calling, brethren, that there are not many wise according to the flesh, not many powerful, not many noble, but the stupidity of the world God chooses, that he may be disgracing the wise, and the weakness of the world God chooses, that he may be disgracing the strong, and the ignoble and the contemptible things of the world God chooses, and that which is not, that he should be discarding that which is, so that no flesh at all should be boasting in God's sight. Here are even more less than flattering characteristics of most of the chosen. Paul tells us there are not many wise according to the flesh, not many powerful, not many noble, but the stupidity of the world God chooses. I was not wise according to the flesh and the things of this world. I was not powerful or noble, but God chose me the stupidity of the world. And we are told the weakness of the world God chooses and the ignoble and the contemptible things of the world God chooses. I was weak, ignoble, and contemptible, exactly how God made me to be. God chose people like me so that he may be disgracing the wise and the strong of the world, so that no flesh at all should be boasting in God's sight. There's absolutely nothing among these characteristics for me to boast in. If I was strong and wise and noble, I might have good reason to boast. No flesh will boast in God's sight. All is of God. He is the chooser. And here's another characteristic of those whom God chooses to be merciful to. Romans 11:32. For God locks up all together in stubbornness, that he should be merciful to all. We all do hard time in the prison of stubbornness. It's part of God's plan for all of us. But God's plan also includes him being merciful to all in his time. All will benefit from God's mercy. Some now, the rest later. Add stubbornness to my list. It's on yours too. I mentioned that God revealed himself to me when I was 22 years old, but that he chose me way before that. So when did God choose me? 2 Timothy 1, 9-10 God saves us and calls us with a holy calling, not in accord with our acts, but in accord with his own purpose and the grace which is given to us in Christ Jesus before times eonian, yet now is being manifested through the advent of our Savior Christ Jesus, who indeed abolishes death, yet illuminates life and incorruption through the evangel. Before I was even created, before I uttered my first cry, before I pooped in my first diaper, God's plan, including his salvation and grace for me, was already set before times Eonian. Yes, God actually planned everything out long ago, and everything in his universe is going according to his plan. He's not just making things up as he goes. He's not watching to see what we will do and then reacting to us. He's actively causing everything that happens. His plan is running not in accord with our acts, but in accord with his own purpose. And as we see in verse 10, his ancient plan is being manifested through the appearance of our Savior, Christ Jesus. Everything is always by God's choice, not ours. We can see an example of this in the story of a very famous set of twins. We see in Romans 9:11 the story of Jacob and Esau. For the twin brothers Jacob and Esau, not as yet being born, nor putting into practice anything good or bad, that the purpose of God may be remaining as a choice, not out of acts, but of him who is calling. As with all of us, the choice of God for Jacob and Esau was set long before they were born, long before either of them did anything good or bad. Ephesians 1, 3-4 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blesses us with every spiritual blessing among the celestials in Christ, according as he chooses us in him before the disruption of the world. Again, we see that God's choice of the chosen was set long before the chosen were even created, even before the disruption of the world. All is of God and all happens because of his choice alone. Because God chose me long before he created me, he molded me so that I would check off all of these boxes. How do I know I'm chosen by God? Because I believe in... No! My being chosen by God has absolutely nothing to do with what I did 
or do. I know I'm chosen because God has granted me belief in the four foundational facts of the good news of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. The Apostle Paul writes, now I am making known to you, brethren, the evangel, or the good news, which I bring to you, which also you accepted, in which also you stand, through which also you are saved, if you are retaining what I said in bringing the evangel to you, outside and accept you believe feignedly. For I give over to you among the first what also I accepted, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was entombed, and that he has been roused the third day according to the scriptures. God, in his grace, granted me belief in these four crucial facts about his son. Christ died. Christ died for our sins. He was entombed. He was roused the third day. All of these facts are according to the scriptures. He died according to the scriptural truth of death, that the dead are the dead dead, not the living dead. He died for our sins, as the scriptures reveal. He was entombed, as the scriptures reveal. And he was roused the third day, as the scriptures reveal. I am very happy and very thankful to have been chosen by God, to have been overwhelmed with grace, shown mercy in this life, and granted to believe in this life. I'm happy to have been released from the prison of stubbornness. I'm even happy to have been chosen to suffer for the sake of Christ. I know that I was not chosen because I am better than anyone else, or I have done things that others haven't done. It is all of God. He chose me before I was me. God, all by himself, transformed this blaspheming atheist into a believer in Jesus. And he is now in the process of making me competent. I am his achievement, not my own. I have absolutely nothing to boast of in myself. But I will boast in this. Look at what my God and my Savior have done for me transforming a blaspheming atheist into a believer in Christ. All praise goes to them. Whether you are part of God's chosen or not, God and Christ have a vast love for you, and they will set you free from the prison of stubbornness. They will overwhelm you with grace, mercy, and love, and they will save you from sin and death. Watch this video next. It's not too bad.